Hi everyone and welcome to today's webinar on assessment validation. I'm Emma Marks and I am the Director of Engagement and Education in ASPA. Now today's session will run for about 60 minutes. So over the last couple of months we've focused uh, on examining the requirements for assessment validation and each week for five weeks we published on our website information about assessment validation requirements. We also took the opportunity to embed videos into the weekly posts, which have actually received some really overwhelming positive feedback, and I do hope you did enjoy them. And today I'm excited to launch this webinar, providing you as an audience the opportunity to ask ATQA and also our guest speaker specific questions on the requirements of assessment validation. So I will welcome our guest speakers in a moment, but did want to thank those individuals that have pre-submitted questions for our panel. And for those wishing to submit questions during the webinar, I'll provide you with the Slido QR code in the next few slides. Now, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners and custodians of country throughout Australia and acknowledge their continuing connection to land, sea and community. I pay my respects to the people, cultures and elders, past, present and emerging, and extend my respect to any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islanders who are in audience today. So we're going to split this webinar into two segments. First, I'll just give a brief run through of the topic we covered and just highlight some key takeaways from those five weeks. But to clarify, I'm not planning on talking for a really long time. And that's because we'll get into the, the most valuable part of the webinar, which is the question and answer session. And this will be your opportunity to ask questions either of ASPA or a VET representative. A reminder though that about today's questions, today's topic is focused on assessment validation. So any question you ask does need to be about that topic. And also please keep the questions broad and relevant to the entire audience. We are unable to answer questions specific to individual situations. Okay, so on to Slido. So please take note of the following QR code and event code, which is L382. With the QR code, you can take a photo of it from your mobile and then follow the path to Slido. You can also go from your computer via the website name on this slide, which is just slido.com. Now this is the portal which will allow you to submit your questions regarding assessment validation requirements for the panel. We'll also add uh, the web link into the GoToWebinar comments field shortly, so you can click on that link if it's easier. And a few questions have already been preloaded. They're the ones that we received ahead of time and some other questions are just starting to come through now. So before we start the Q&A session, I just wanted to cover a few key items that we've published over the five chapters of the Spotlight on Series 2 Assessment Validation. And if I can ignore just for a second that assessment validation is a compliance obligation, really want you to think that assessment validation is a key tool for providers who are seeking to get the best results from their training and assessment systems. So as we move towards a focus on self-assurance to achieve excellence in training outcomes, how you use assessment validation plays an important role in how you operate your business, how you continuously improve your practices, how you ensure students are getting the best possible outcomes, and in how you have confidence in what it is that you're doing. So this series, we also incorporated short videos to give providers an additional interactive opportunity in understanding assessment validation. So definitely please re-familiarise yourself with the series on Spotlight On. You can do this by going to the ASPA website, um, clicking on RTOs and then focus on compliance to view the series and that link is also on this page. Now remember if you would like to ask a question related to assessment validation please submit this through taking a photo of the QR code that's on the screen or it is now written in the webinar go to webinar comments field. One thing as well that I just just added into the, the slide to discussion is we know that yesterday NCBER released a report on, on assessment validation. Um, I will say entirely coincidental in terms of time frame, but a really good coincidence in terms of the time frames. Now the report is called Begin with the End RTO Practices and Views on Independent Validation of Assessment. And it's really important that that's actually what the report's about. It's about independent validation of assessment. 
Um, I'll confess I have reviewed or, or skimmed it, but I haven't really had time yet to go through it in detail. It only came out yesterday. Um, the one thing though that I did take as a, a really good takeaway was a, a key point that they noted, which is a shift in mentality from compliance to quality assurance will help reap the rewards from validation. And I thought that was really nice and succinct. So before we get started, sorry, I did want to acknowledge that there are a lot of terms that the vet sector uses, which are really similar and as such can lead people to think that they are interchangeable. This was also acknowledged in the NCVR report, so I want to make it clear by the terms that what we're meaning in the context today. It can also be quite confusing because there are some obligations that are specific requirements of the standards, and there are other things which, although they're not specifically listed in the standards, you either have to do them in order to assure yourself of your compliance, or which used to be part of the standards and are still really good practice to help you monitor and ensure compliance. But I can't stress enough really with these, whether something is part of the standards or not, if it's something that will give you confidence that you're meeting your obligations, if it can help guide you to be cutting edge and innovative, um, if it can help your business grow, if it can result in your students being fully job ready, if it can help make you a preferred provider to employers, well, absolutely, that is what self-assurance and continuous improvement is all about and really consider that as part of your business. So going through the three main terms that I've got on the slide here, the first one is verification. And I've used this word more than validating. And I know in the NCVR report, I think they use the term pre-validation, but it, it essentially means the same thing. So what I mean by verification is the practice that occurs before you actually start using those assessment tools. So this is after you have either designed the tools or you've bought in um, commercially developed tools and you're just starting to look at them. This is actually verifying that the tools that you plan on using meet the requirements of the training package and are designed to ensure that assessment will be conducted with the principles of assessment and rules of evidence in, in mind. So thing to make really blatantly clear, no matter whether you develop your own tools or whether you use commercially developed tools, you do need to verify that they are fit for purpose and that they will meet your needs. This will ensure that future students can be accurately and consistently assessed and that your assessment system meets the compliance obligations of clause 1.8 of the standards. Now, the next term is moderation. And if you've been around for a long time, you will remember that moderation used to be a requirement under the standards. So you probably remember what moderation is. Uh, but for those who are new to the sector, or if you have completely blocked the memory out, moderation is something that occurs right before the end of the, right at the end of your assessment, but before you actually finalise and record the assessment outcome. So moderation allows you to look at a sample of completed assessments and make that judgment about whether the tools resulted in the intended assessment outcome. So whether the evidence collected meets the rules of evidence and whether the assessor's judgment is consistent if it's resulted in a valid, sufficient, authentic and current judgment. Now, the reason why moderation can be so good is that you're obviously checking your intended outcomes before you're making that final decision. So this way, if there is something that's not quite right, you can reassess or conduct another assessment or you can challenge tests before actually finalising and determining that competency. So you're assuring your RTO that you're only issuing a competent decision to a learner who can, you can confidently say has met the requirements of the training product, which is clause 3.1. But the big one, and the one that is actually explicitly described in the standards is validation or assessment validation. Now, validation occurs after assessment is finalised and is retrospe it retrospectively reviews the assessment system and practice to enable your RTO to continuously improve what you do and how you do it. So the term validation is defined in the standards, independent validation is defined in the standards, and also the term statistically valid is defined in the standards. And ASCA will always use those words in the context of those standards definitions. 
Although the standards describe the frequency in which you must validate your training products, I will say please remember that that is the minimum requirement. You can absolutely conduct the validation process more frequently. Um, and this could be because you're using new assessment tools. So you've already verified them. Um, you know that they met the requirements before use, but as a check to make sure they're doing as, as intended and pick up some quick wins. It could be because the training products that you deliver are considered to be high risk. Uh, perhaps you have, have had a change of assessors and you want to see if there is consistency. It could also be because you deliver a training product that's had changes to technology, legislation, licensing requirements or other processes. And so there's benefit actually continuously improving the assessment tools that you use. So talking about why assessment validation is so important, validation means better outcomes. It's better outcomes for your students who will be able to demonstrate workplace skills immediately upon graduation. Um, it gives you a better reputation within the industry as graduates from your provider can go on to prove themselves capable. And it gives better relationships and engagement with the industry. Validation of assessment also encourages continuous improvement by ensuring all your assessment systems are performing at their best across their full scope of registration by encouraging you to conduct routine improvement activities, by helping to create more efficient and effective processes in developing and testing your systems, and by allowing you to reflect on your assist assessment systems and make them better. Now, assessment validation is a must. It does ensure you meet your compliance requirements, not just with clauses 1.9, 1.10, 1.11, also with clause 1.8 and 3.1. And finally, validation early in delivery allows you to address any gaps which might exist in assessments, ensuring better outcomes for future students. And it provides retraining and reassessment opportunities for completed or current students. So your validation sample size must be statistically valid. Now, statistically valid means for the purposes of the standards, a random sample of appropriate size that is selected to enable confidence that the result is sufficiently accurate to be accepted as representative of the total population of assessments being validated. And that's direct from the glossary of terms in the standards. So the ASPA website has a validation sample calculator, which you can use. It's not a must, but it's there if you'd like to use it to help you decide how many completed assessments you need to validate. I will say validation can be undertaken by one person or by a team of people. Your RTO must ensure the review process is completed by people who collectively meet all the requirements. In almost all circumstances, uh, validators can be employees of your RTO or you could seek the assistance of external validators. And something that I know that is particular, of particular relevance to smaller RTOs, the trainer and assessor who delivered and assessed the training product being validated can participate in the assessment validation process as part of the team. However, they cannot conduct the validation on their own. They cannot determine the validation outcome for any assessment judgments that they made, and they can't be the lead validator in the assessment team. And I will say, please remember that validating TAE has additional and different requirements. So if you are planning to add any TAE qualification or the assessor skill set to your scope of registration, you must demonstrate completion of an independent validation of the assessment process for your current scope of registration and of the tools and systems you plan to use for the TAE qualification or assessor skill set. Now, if you already have the TAE qualifications or assessor skill sets on your scope of registration, you must use independent validators when validating the assessment systems for the training products. However, please remember that um, you don't need to actually use an independent validator for all of the other training products on your scope. So if you deliver TAE and business, you do need to use an independent validator for the TAE, but it doesn't have to be for your business scope of registration. Okay, so please note that we do traditionally receive a lot of questions during this webinar and quite a few questions are starting to come through. And the best part about Slido is you can upvote questions as well. So if there's a really good question on there, 
click the like button because what we'll be doing is looking at the top questions and they're the questions that we're going to be asking. So the more popular ones bring to the top. Um, we probably won't be able to answer all of them. So we do have uh, people behind the scenes who vet the questions coming through to make sure they're relevant to the topic. Um, and we do get quite a lot of questions that come through that we don't necessarily get to answer. We do keep a record of all questions though, and we'll do our best to respond in future edu educative tools if we can't respond in this session. So I would like to invite, now that we've, we're over the theory part, I'd like to invite both Alex and Karen to turn their cameras on. And they're saying, coming through. Here we Good are. Afternoon. Welcome, Hello, and thanks for joining me. Thank so we'll do much. the first, we'll do the introductions first so everybody knows who is in the group today. Now, Alex Schroeder is the CEO of Vet Prep Australia and as a compliance consultant has a wide ranging experience across multiple RTOs and assisting them with compliance issues. So as you can see from this slide, Alex's wealth of knowledge and experience is across multiple sectors, including law, commerce, marketing, management and quality and governance. Now, as well as having a career and management experience in forensic compliance auditing, professional development for vet practitioners, RTO initial registration and re-registration support, mentoring and coaching for RTO owners and managers, business growth and staff development, strategic business planning and implementation, organisational training and corporate training and development. And that's a mouthful. Alex is also a member of ASCA's Stakeholder Liaison Group and people will know about our SLG group which engages and consults with providers and other key stakeholders on ASCA's approach to engagement and education and also identifies and responds to key issues facing providers. Now our SLG group comprises of 17 members of which uh, 15 are RTOs across Australia and across different industry types, sizes, uh, make up it, whether they're public, private, community, high schools, universities, all of those sorts of things. And we also have two consultants on the panel as well. So Alex is perfectly placed to discuss and answer your questions on assessment validation with this wealth of knowledge and experience in the vet sector. And thank you, Alex, for joining me today. Thank you, Emma. And we're also pleased to welcome Karen Kerr, who is our Senior Regulatory Policy Officer in the Regulatory Policy team here. Now, Karen has actually worked with ASPA for 10 years since its inception. And I will say ASPA celebrated its 10th birthday on the 1st of July this year, so we're, we're all 10 years old. Now, she originally came to us from the New South Wales Government Agency, VTAB or VETAB, and Karen has worked in various roles across the agency. So she started as an auditor within the regulatory operations sections in both Sydney and also in the Canberra offices. She's been a coordinator and liaison with the panel auditor section, specifically coordinating and managing workloads across ASPRA's panel auditor network. She was a, an integral part of the ASPRA reform task force driving ASPA's organisational change in line with the organisation's reform agenda and is now a senior regulatory policy officer with the regulatory policy team where she's contributing to ASPA's new policies and project development as we progress through that reform agenda. So Karen is also perfectly placed to be on our panellists today, drawing upon her skills across the vets, ASPA and ASPA. So welcome Karen. Thank you very much. Yeah, what I'm going to do now is actually stop showing my screen so you can just see us because that's probably the best way to have the conversation that where you're just seeing our faces, it makes it a bit better. What we'll do is we'll start, as I said, with what the most popular question is or the question that's right at the top. Um, as I said, we are looking straight on the Slido screen as well, so we're not seeing anything in the back end. We are seeing exactly what it is that you see. Now that's got an advantage in that um, you can see what questions are going to be coming up, but also ourselves as the panel can see what questions are coming up so we can start to start to plan our responses. So the first question, and I confess I have not yet read it yet, which is when there is an update to a qualification and that qualification is superseded, yet most of the qualification is very similar to the new one. Do we need to revalidate in the entirety 
or simply the elements and units of competencies that have been changed? I might start with this one from a regulator perspective and Karen, I'll ask you that question. Yeah, no, that's fine. Um, I would say you have um, a responsibility to make sure that those changes um, don't affect your current assessment tool. So that verification that we talked about needs to go into place there to verify that you don't have any gaps, even if they're small changes in units and it's you know an equivalent superseded um, unit or qualification, you still need to do that process of verifying that you're meeting all the um, unit of competency requirements within the qualification or the skill set, um, whatever it may be. Um, I wouldn't say, if, if you see it as a risk um, that you haven't looked at this unit yet or this qualification yet, as um, Emma just discussed, you could bring that forward in your val um, validation plan um, and start validating sooner. But you can kind of assess that risk based off what the qualification is, what the changes are. I'm assuming if it's equivalent, superseded, there shouldn't be drastic changes, obviously, if it's equivalent, but you kind of have to assure yourself um, that your um, assessment tools and your assessment system meet everything in the new unit. Excellent. And I'll, uh, I, I actually went myself back to the screen where I had the three definitions on there. So this is very much a verification process before you're actually using the new tools and the new, the new qualification and units of competency. Um, and I think the way you've even answered the, asked the question, you've almost half done the verification process. You've done a mapping in the first place to pick up what the differences are. And you've done a review of um, your assessment tools to know where those, where those elements and competency requirements are actually in the assessment. So you've actually half done a verification process, which then means that you, you could make the judgment that that's actually all you need to do. Alex, did you have anything else to contribute there? I think, Emma, thank you. I think, you know, so often when we have qualifications that are equivalent and superseded, RTOs often forget that when a qualification or a unit of competency has been superseded and is equivalent, there are small changes within the unit of competency. And quite often what RTOs do, they see equivalent and superseded and on their resources, they'll go and change the code and perhaps the title and they'll think their tools are then valid and they'll think their tools are then really implemented without actually doing the verification and going through every single change step by step to ensure that the, that the new tools do actually meet the equivalent and superseded unit of competency. From a best practice point of view, it is always important to make sure at every step in, in, your, in your operations that your assessment tools are valid because if your assessment tools aren't valid or if there's any part of deficiency within your assessment tools, the ongoing snowballing effect vis-a-vis -vis non compliances and also vis-a-vis -vis the potential impact towards your students is magnificent. It really is. So, you know, it's, it's once again, just in summary, it's really good practice to make sure that whenever any change has been made to your assessment resources, always go through, always do the verification, regardless of how small those changes are. That's an excellent response. Thank you very much. Now, the next question I actually think is a very, very easy answer and, and the answer is going to be no, but I'll, I'll read this one out, which is, does pre-assessment validation count towards your 50% of assessment validation in the first three years? So it, it, it's a compliance question, so I'll throw this one for a very, hopefully an easy response to Karen. Um, to put it short, uh, no. <laughs> um, I, I guess um, what they're saying with this pre-assessment validation, it's actually not a validation. I think. Um, we don't actually validate until a tool has been used um, and a student has used it and an assessor has used it. Um, so I believe what they're saying is more of that moderation and verification prior to it. And does that count towards the 50%? So that doesn't because it's actually not validation. Like um, Alex has just said, it's very good practice to make sure you do that um, prior um, to getting your tools out there and in use. But yes, no. <laughs> That was an easy one, thank you. <laughs> I'm glad I got the same response. So we'll go to the next question, um, and that is for assessment validation, is it necessary to validate all of the tasks 
in an assessment for a unit? And actually, Alex, I'll ask this one to you. I think there's 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 a there's a slight difference and still in alignment between best best practice and necessity, because at the end of the day, if you do not validate or verify every single assessment task in your assessment tool, how do you know that your tool is actually valid? And how do you know that your tool can produce valid results? So in my opinion, absolutely. It's almost like, you know, going to the kitchen and making yourself a coffee, but leaving out the sugar because you thought, well, the sugar isn't, isn't really necessary, then going and saying, oh, my coffee doesn't quite work. That's a good analogy. Um, so, okay, so on to the next question is, can you explain more about the five year cycle? When does the five years begin? And if a training package changes, does the five years start over? And I'll actually ask both of you this question, because I think it's really good to get this from a regulatory perspective and what are the requirements, but I also think it's really good to get this from a best practice perspective as well. So we'll start with Karen from a regulatory side. Yes, I mean, it's a very good question. When does the five year cycle begin? And I know a lot of uh, providers have come um, into the industry since that um, the validation um, standards have been put in place in 2015. And truly, your five year cycle starts when you um, begin um, as a um, RTO. Um, and from then, you work out your validation plan over that five year cycle. Now, that validation plan over the five year cycle includes everything on your scope of registration. So, if you um, have a training package that's come in, it needs to fall within the five years for when you're um, the um, when you're doing the verification of the new training package and then the assessment and I mean sorry the validation after your assessments. So it doesn't necessarily restart the clock because your clock is started upon your registration. Yeah. If that um, makes sense, um, is that how you see it too, Emma? <laughs> yep. Um, and Alex, if you've got any examples of best practice about how people plan their five-year cycle. So before I go there, I just want to make one thing. Um, I want to put one thing out there. Validating your assessment tools on a five-year cycle is a, is a minimum benchmark. So it's a case of that is what RTOs need to do as a minimum. However, if you want to strive to be a real quality provider that ensures that your students are getting quality outcomes and that want to ensure that your, I suppose your entire operation is really quality assured, you probably want to have a look at, at validating more than just once every five years and maybe having a validation cycle that is a little bit tighter than five years. But like I said, you know, that but five years is our minimum benchmark standard. And it's a case of, um, yes, you know, your, your, your five year cycle, as, as Karen says, starts when you, when your RTO is registered. And, but when a new qualification comes out, we've got to go through the verification and the moderation stages in any case before we actually go ahead and start, well, the verification stage, at least before we start using our tools, and then the moderation stage as we are finalising our judgments. And if we have a new qualification come in, as Karen said, you know, we need to roll it into our five year, into our five year cycle. But also remembering that as an RTO, you need to do an assessment of whether that qualification is considered as high risk and not necessarily high risk insofar as work safe, you know, work safe, um, Victoria or work safe for Queensland, but high risk insofar as your potential assessment outcomes and your potential, your potential graduate achievements. And if you do have, if that qualification does have a higher risk than others, you need to ensure that you actually do your validation sooner in your five year cycle rather than later. Yeah, I really agree with that, Alex, that risk is not just about safety. Yeah. Um, it is about those outcomes and is there consistency in those outcomes or inconsistency? I think Emma mentioned earlier, have you had a new set of trainers and assessors on yes. um, brand new and you need to test that um, in, a, in a validation sense to make sure that um, they're following the assessment system appropriately. There's lots of things that lead to risks um, and risk and outcomes. Yeah. And Karen, and you've just raised the, sorry, Emma. Um, Karen, you you've just, just raised the, You've just raised a really good point, um, Karen, because so often RTOs don't actually realise that their, their trainers and assessors or 
on average, trainers and assessors are probably one of the highest risk areas of an, an, an RTO's operations. And it's one thing to be working with your trainers and assessors that you know their work, you know the quality of their work, but when you get a new trainer and assessor in, regardless whether they are new within your organization or new to the sector or even a new TAE graduate, they pose a very, very high risk to your RTO. And any RTO that has employed or contracted a trainer and assessor that they are not familiar with their work or that they haven't actually seen their work should consider any of their assessment outcomes as a higher risk for a period of time until they've had an opportunity to go and evaluate the accuracy and the thoroughness of the trainer and assessor's um, marking methodologies. That's a great add-on. And the other one that I thought of, not necessarily related to risk, but if you in your assessment validation identify some continuous improvement in, of a particular training product, that can also be the trigger for you to say, well, there are other training products that are really similar that we deliver that we need to validate now as well. Mm -hmm. So that's, it's almost like a trigger to go, well, we know we can improve with this qualification here. Do we deliver other qualifications in the same way or similar qualifications yeah. with the same learning cohort or something like that? Let's look at those and improve them at the exact same time. And that's, it's your opportunity to make things better across the board. That's an excellent point. So we'll go to the next question, and I think I can answer this one because it was in my slide a, a bit earlier, which was, are providers allowed to use their own sampling approach to validation, or the, is the requirement to use ASPA's validation calculator only for sampling? Uh, the answer to that is you can absolutely use your own sampling approach to validation. It just needs to meet the statistically valid definition that is in uh, the standards for RTO. So your glossary of terms is right at the front of the standards. If you, if some people skip over them, you go straight to the numbers, but it's right at the very front of the glossary. The reason we created that validation calculator was actually back in 2015 when the standards changed, there was a lot of questions around, well, how do we know how many that we have to do? So we, we went out and we, we created a validation calculator just so that, to make it as easy as possible and, you know, give the perfect example that I'm definitely not a maths person for some stupid reason they put me in advanced maths in year 10 and it was the biggest regret that Mr Mans ever did. Um, so if I can use the tool and it makes sense to me then the intent is it should be able to make sense to absolutely everybody. So that's the reason we've created the tool but you don't have to use that tool. If you've got another one that is meets the statistically valid requirements and you can show us exactly how it works, then that's absolutely fantastic for you to use. Uh, we'll go to the next question and Alex, I'm gonna put this one to you because I suspect you might have had this circumstance before. So it'd be really good to hear about this. So what if the validation team makes a judgment that the assessor has made the wrong decision on the assessment outcome for a candidate? What would you do in that circumstance? You take a deep breath and you'd go, oh my gosh, did this happen? <laughs> Just to give you an example, I think so many, so many practitioners don't actually realise that the validity of your assessment tools affects straight out seven different, sorry, eight different clauses of the of the standards and potentially even eleven. And that is excluding clause one point nine of the validation, because if your assessment judgments are incorrect, the very, very first thing or the very, I suppose the most serious role on effect is that potentially the RTO is at risk of issuing AQF documentation to students that haven't actually fully um, evidenced their competency. And like I said, the role on effect from there is, is massive. Now, if you are in a position where this was picked up before any AQF documentation was actually issued, you are in a fortunate position because you can, you can rectify it in a few ways. The most common way to go and rectify it is having a look to see, obviously, you know, you, you may want to go and get a second opinion and see if your validation team's judgment was correct. But if it is, the easiest way to rectify it is to see where the assess, these, where the assessments, sorry, the assessors' judgments were incorrect and see if over the course of the study, if the graduates had perhaps evidenced their competency in various other 
assessment task. So you'll get to, let's say, one unit of competency where you might have, you know, five or six different assessment activities. You get to UOC number two and the assess, uh, the assessor made a wrong judgment there. There's nothing that stops you from going into the student's other assess, assessments and see if the wrong decision or if, if, the, if the answer to the wrong decision, the right, sorry, the right answer to the wrong decision has, has been covered elsewhere. If you do find that the assessor's judgment was incorrect and you don't actually have evidence that that student has met the requirements or has evidenced their competency in other assessment tasks, you must go ahead and you must get them to do a supplementary assessment where they can actually evidence their competency because we need to always remember in VET, we don't need to show, or students don't need to show their competence 80% of the time. We don't mark assessments eight out of 10 or 10 out of 10. You either are competent or you're not. There's no gray area. So like I said, if, if your assessments judgments were incorrect and you cannot find that the student had, had evidenced their competency in other assessment tasks, you need to get them to go and actually do a gap assessment. If you are in the difficult position where the student has actually graduated or they've left the, the RTO, you've then and, and you cannot find evidence of them having demonstrated their competence for that requirement in any of the other assessments, you then have a requirement under the NBR Act to actually turn around and to draw the, the student in for a reassessment and if or for a gap assessment, and if they aren't able to or if they're not willing to come in for a gap assessment, you're then sitting in a situation where you have issued an AQF documentation to a person that hasn't demonstrated their competency in full and therefore you've reached the NBR Act. And in most circumstances, the correct, the correct rectification of that is to actually go and cancel your student's um, AQF qualification. It's something that RTOs don't want to do. It's something that can cause tremendous strife to the students. However, as vet practitioners and as RTOs and as educators, we have the absolute obligation to ensure that nobody's walking around out there with an AQF document that they actually haven't demonstrated their competency in. Yeah, and I'll, I'll add to that because that's that's actually the that's the hardest time it, where, where you've completed a student that they've, they've gone on their merry way and then you do your validation and you realize that there's a gap which is where i mean there's a, there's a few things as you've said that come in if, if you've verified the tools before their use so you've actually checked that they're going to work before you start using them the chance of missing something at the end is obviously greatly reduced. If you use moderation as a, a sampling, and also it's, it's an improvement of how your trainers and assessors operate and, mm. and, and other things as well, then that's actually checking that the assessments are working the way you intended them mm. to work in the first place. So you're, you're mitigating by doing other things apart from just assessment validation. If you get to that circumstance where you've got a completed student where they, you know, there, there is something missing. It it's, becomes quite hard because there is that judgment about, well, what is the impact on the student? What is the impact on the employer, on their workforce, all of those sorts of things. Um, and if there is that, that really big impact where a student has that piece of paper, but they can't actually do the job that's on that piece of paper, that's where you do have to go to that, that absolute end and go, well, we've got to make a judgment and decision here. Um, we've had circumstances in, in many, many, many years ago, I think it was around 2015 even, where um, we recalled a number of qualifications, and this was in the security industry. Um, and at that time, particularly if someone had been in the security industry for a substantial period of time since they got that qualification, then competency had actually been developed over that time. But new students in particular just weren't competent, so the, the qualifications did have to be recalled. It's a really hard one, though, and it's, it's also probably links back to that last question about risk um, and, and the frequency with which to do your validation. Doing it more often than those five years will help you in that circumstance. Um, I'd also say if you if you come up with it in that sort of circumstance, 
that's probably where you have to start validating, well, well you, you would absolutely have to start validating a greater number of students in that unit of competence in qualification, mm -hmm. but also who's the assessor and do you actually have to start validating some of the other qualifications or is it actually missing from the assessment tool? Who wrote the assessment? Do you actually need to look at more units of competency to make mm -hmm. sure that there aren't errors across the board? So that's where risk comes into play and you've really got to ramp up your validation for it. So the next question, can you give any advice for validating units which sit across multiple qualifications or whether you should validate different units in each qualification rather than shared units? So I think in this scenario here, let's say we've got two completely different ones, hospitality and childcare, but let's say both of them have first aid for some reason. Would you, and Karen, I'll ask you from a regulatory perspective as well as what you've seen, would you actually bring in the validation of the first aid unit and apply it to both qualifications or what would you do in that circumstance? Um, I mean, I can speak to what I've seen, um, not necessarily what I would do, but I would, uh, I've seen um, that uh, people use it as killing um, two birds with one stone um, across their validation, um, which I totally get because if they have got a mammoth amount of um, qualifications and units to get through, it's a good way to do that. But and and maybe Alex can shed more light on best practice. But I think the most the best practice I've seen is that they will shine a light on it in one um, qualification and consider it for the next one. But the other qualification, they still look at um, different units in the next one. But if there are obviously issues um, across the first aid, um, they would quickly in, um, work through that um, first aid unit and the other one and obviously update across. But they wouldn't, say if you're only looking at two units um, per qualification, um, they would look at two different units in the second qualification, but still consider the first aid unit from the first qualification. Hope that was clear enough. Um, but there is a very much a temptation um, to kill two birds with one stone um, in that instance. Um, but um, yeah, I would say best practice is that you expand beyond um, that, um, but also you know, implement any changes um, required from that validation process. Yeah, and I think it, it gives a really good, really good uh, lineage between what is minimum requirements and what actually is, and not even best practice, but what is actually good practice. So if you really want your RTO to be a good provider and to deliver good quality outcomes and get the outcomes for your student, that's where you would be doing more than that absolute bare minimum. Um, it's also probably, and I probably use a, a really, really vague, to, you know, two, two completely different qualifications. Context is also really important. So if it is hospitality and childcare, I'd be, I, I'd be seeing though that there's not really a huge relationship between those two. Something similar such as a Cert 3 and a Cert 4 in business or Cert 4 in business and a Cert 4 in, in one of the other business qualifications where it's slightly more related, it's a bit different. Um, but again, it's, yeah, it's very much a difference between what is your bare minimum requirements to get through an audit as opposed to doing the best for your RTO so you're getting a really good outcome, you're getting really good outcomes for your students and your providers and your employers are trusting you. Yeah, the benefits definitely outweigh the means of that one, yeah. So the next question is, oh, should the team validating be outside, uh, should the team validating be outside the RTO that uses the tool? Would it be best practice to work with, uh, oh, would it be best practice to work with other RTOs to validate each other's tools? Now that's an interesting question. Alex, have you seen that scenario before? We have seen it before where RTOs almost form a little validation consortium and they will go and validate each other's tools for them. And it's, in, in my opinion, it's a really, really good way of doing it because A, it means that you don't have the exorbitant costs of external validations, but it also means that you can have people with hands-on industry experience teaching the same kind of cohorts of students having a very critical analysis of your tools. Unfortunately, so often RTOs are reluctant to do it because they believe that there's a risk that the external RTOs might go and use their, their assessment tools. And a lot of RTOs believe that their assessment tools are 
almost the holy grail. You know, the assessment tools are incredibly precious and the assessment tools make their RTO stand out, etc. Where I think it's a bit of a, a bit of a shorthanded view to take because I don't know of any student that's ever gone, you know what, I'm gonna go and study with ABC College because I love their assessments. Um, you know, it's it's the learning experience, it's the student experience that actually makes an RTO's um, their reputation. And like I said, you know, using, if you can go into collaboration with other RTOs and have a mutual validation um, or a reciprocal validation arrangement, I think it's fantastic. If you do do that, it is a really good idea to on a, or intermittently get somebody from the outside to just go over the validations in any case and maybe do a, a um, high level review that the validation practices being done by the RTOs, by the reciprocal RTOs, they are actually good. Um, but like I said, I think it's a fantastic idea and it's also a very cost effective way to, to, to ensure that your assessment tools and your validations get done. Yeah, I completely agree. And one thing that I've I have noticed really in the last 12 months, and um, Stakeholder Liaison Group is a really good example of this, but also, I mean, even the Spotlight On series with validation and um, past one that we did, and the one that I'll talk about, which is coming up, where RTOs are actually now becoming more willing to share about their experiences. And it's for benefit, not only it's for benefit for other RTOs, it's also for their own benefit as well. Because having that conversation about well, what are you doing allows you to stop and reflect, to think about improvements for yourself, but also to, it, it's for the wider vet sector. It's, it's actually improving the quality of vet. And that's the, I mean, that's the, the end game, I think, for all of us. So, I would love it. I think it's it's fantastic the way we're starting to change to be more collaborative across the sector as well. Now, the next question is, how can I validate if I haven't yet delivered training and assessments to any students? And I would say, so this is validation probably as part of that five-year plan, um, if it hasn't yet validated. Um, Karen, have you had this experience in an audit? Yeah, um, this happens often, especially if we're looking at someone within the first couple of years of the registration, um, a bit slow off the mark um, for, for various, various reasons. Um, and you really honestly can't validate because you haven't completed um, any assessments. But what we would be looking at is what is the plan? Is there a really good systemic plan for everything on their scope in which they intend to um, with, you know, within the five years, or um, as um, Alex said, it'd be better if it was shorter, um, a, you know, that five year life cycle. So what is the plan? How do they intend to do all their validating? Um, what, how are they gonna do their sampling? All that stuff really well articulated and mapped out for us and really able to de um, describe that um, to us, um, to, as, to the regulator, how they intend to do that, which gives us a lot of confidence that once you do start delivering that training, that you've got systems in place ready to validate as soon as you've got outcomes to look at. And the other thing I'll add to that, again, from a verification perspective, if it's been two, three years since you first created those tools and you haven't yet used them for, for whatever reason, again, sit back and think, well, how has your industry changed? How has technology changed? How has legislation changed? Also, how has best practice delivery and assessment change because that might be your opportunity to review them, to improve them for when you actually do go to use them. So there is always that benefit to re-verify them and go, well, still, can I make them better? And that's the, that's the, the, the end game, can you make it better? Yeah, it's not about finding the gaps often, it's how can we improve and escalate yeah. um, the satisfaction and the outcomes of these units. And actually, the, this next question is a great question, and I'm glad it, it's made it to the top. So one of the barriers to effective validation, especially for small RTOs, is the large amounts of time consuming paperwork. Are there any suggestions about best forms of evidence to keep or trying anything that RTOs are, are keeping that they don't need to? So Alex, I'll, I'll throw to you with this one here because I'm pretty sure you work with quite a lot of small RTOs just to understand how they try and manage the validation process. 
So insofar, thank you for that, Emma. So insofar as the documentation that they need to keep, um, my understanding and certainly the way that we advise our clients um, insofar as the NVR Act and the standards is that once you have completed your validation process on anything, you need to obviously have a, have a validation outcomes report. And it's my understanding you don't actually need to be able to evidence how the validation outcome was achieved, but you need to be able to evidence that your that your products were validated. And another thing that's really important to have is also to have evidence that the people participating in the validation process collectively met the requirements of clauses 111 to, I think it's 110 to, to 111. So if if you have those, those two sets of evidence, um, you should be okay. However, I have noticed, and Karen, I want to throw this over to you. I have noticed in the past few months that ASCO auditors are actually asking RTOs what their processes are. And although we haven't seen the auditors say, prove that you or prove what your processes are, obviously, if an RTO is asked, what is your validation process? And they can't explain it but they miraculously provide these, these, um, these validation outcomes from, or outcome reports from their team. Well, it's, you know, sort of um, two and two sometimes doesn't count up to four. But Karen, what is, what is your response to that? Yeah, so um, I think um, our um, assessors now, sort of as we're calling them now, um, through our, after our change in the reform, we are, we are looking at systems, we are looking at the commitment and capability of the operators. Um, themselves. So um, we would want to see that not only do they have these miraculous, beautiful systems, but they really understand them and they understand how they work. Um, and part of that is being able to describe that to the assessors during an assessment, um, a performance assessment. Um, you know, and there could be a number of factors as to why that may be happening, um, giving people benefit of the doubt that often operational um, um, the operations are handled at a different level than, say, a CEO. They might have a compliance officer or um, a chief operating officer that is in charge of it, and maybe they weren't on site on the day. But in a sense, um, our assessors do flesh that out during our discussions, and we want to see um, that not only you have systems in place, but you really understand them and you're working within those systems and then, um, really taking um, away the outcomes of those systems to do that continuous improvement um, across your whole operations. Absolutely. And if I can just jump in here, sorry, um, Iman Karen. One of the things that we see really often which causes concern is you'll have an RTO that their compliance team or their compliance office or their compliance manager will decide that they are going to do the validations by themselves or they'll do the, between the compliance team, they will go and do the validations because one person might hold the TAE, one person may hold the qualification. However, what RTOs forget, it's not your validators the validating team isn't only about holding the TAE and holding the unit of competency, but they also have to have industry currency as well as VET currency in order to be part of the validation team. And like I said, we so often see it that a compliance manager or a compliance officer will go and they will be the sole validator. And unfortunately for RTOs that do follow that practice, you are actually not following the validation practice properly and without your validation team or the single the single validation or validator having your TAE, the unit of competency that you are validating or the vocational um, equivalent or the vocational competence thereof and you've got VET um, PD relevant to actually teaching, well, relevant to VET learning and VET teaching and you also have your industry experience, you just don't meet the, meet the mark. Yeah, and I agree. I think um, th there's often a focus on having that TAE um, qualification and really that industry currency is extremely important because that's, that's where our students are gonna end up. So are the assessments really suited to give that outcome that they're job ready when they come out of the qualification? Um, as well as having that, um, that um, the vocational um, background um, knowledge as well. Will it work in practice? Are the assessments actually working in practice? Um, it, it's key. And I think that's why it's really good that you have a team doing validation because, you know, I'm, I'm a big fan of, um, you know, four minds are better than one. 
you're going to have a better outcome if you have a team um, and it, it just it's just a better quality um, product I think if you have four people working together with different backgrounds because it's very hard to find one person that hits all the marks um, that isn't already delivering the qualification to begin with um, so yeah um, I think it's, it's very key and the one thing I really focus on is that industry um, currency because that's what we want we want outcomes that they are ready to go into that role as soon as they graduate and the, the one thing I'll add to that is actually not so much about the, the, the validation and, and the units of competency but I, I just all of a sudden just remember realized it we're talking here about continuous improvement and we're saying you know part of the validation process is to continuously improve how you're delivering and how you're assessing and other tools okay but even for the, particularly for the purpose of this question, continuous improvement is also how are you validating? So if you sit back and the feedback that you're getting from your staff is that there is too much paperwork, you're filling in so much, you've got to keep records of everything, that's actually where you stop and sit back and go, okay, it's not working for us. How can we improve what it is that we're doing? So we're still doing it consistently. We're still getting yep. robust outcomes. We're still identifying ways to improve and we're still assuring ourselves that we are validating and we're getting really good outcomes. But is there a different way that we can do it and keep a record of it? And so continuous improvement is not just about the, the, the students and the, the training and assessment. It's also about how you operate and run your business. So that's probably a, a good one to, just to think about well, what it is that you're actually doing. Mm. And I just realised that the time is 2.58 and I did see one question which I thought was a really easy answer that I could uh, answer very, very quickly. I think it's disappeared. But so the top one is, is it necessary to validate every unit in every course in our scope of registration every five years or is a sampling approach for each course acceptable? And I'll answer that one really quickly. It's on your scope of registration. So if you deliver a qualification, the sampling, however, please, 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 if you identify risks, if you identify things that you need to improve, that's when you apply it across the full qualification. The difference, however, of course, is... If you deliver individual units or skill sets, well, that is your scope. So you've got to really consider if you're delivering one-off units, you've, that's, that's kind of like a, a unique little little group that you've got to bring forward. So I'll, I will put that one in. Now, bear with me, noting the time, and I've only got one minute. So let me just make my slides go across and I'll show the screen simply because I really did want to um, draw everyone's attention very quickly to the next Spotlight On series. So the next Spotlight On series is launching this month, uh, right at the end of the month. Uh, the series will focus on assessment. Now, this is a really quite an anticipated topic, which is why I wanted to, to do it just before three o'clock. We've had an overwhelming amount of interest on assessment. Now, we will conclude this series again with the webinar, so providing you with that opportunity to ask specific questions. I will make clear though, we're not intending on delivering this to take away from the TAE qualification because how to deliver assessment is very much part of the CERT 4 in TAE and how to write assessment and all of those sorts of things. So very much for us, the, assessments, the assessment spotlight is looking at best practice and things that you can do to improve. Very much please stay in touch by monitoring our social media accounts, which is AU on Twitter, uh, LinkedIn, we're on there, and of course sign up for our monthly newsletter. I'd like to thank everybody for attending today's webinar and an absolutely huge thank you to Alex Schroeder and Karen Kerr for their insights and tips. This has been a great session um, and I apologise, we're just going over three o'clock. Again, if you have colleagues who are unable to attend today's meeting, as I mentioned at the beginning of this webinar, it is being recorded, so we will load a copy to our webpage shortly after. Also, I know that there are still 25 questions sitting in Slido, so they're the sorts of ones that we'll go through and see if we can improve the Spotlight series to add some additional tips and tricks into it as well. So thank you so much for everybody joining me today. Wherever you are, please stay safe. Um, Thank you very much. Have a wonderful afternoon. Bye.